Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, our presentation, or our summit for uh, today. Um, this is a joint uh, summit with the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at the Watson Institute at Brown University, as well as an event for the Love Data Week that's happening across campus. Please feel free to go on to the Love Data um, site online to see other activities that are happening. Mm -hmm. But this is one of um, an, a really interesting opportunity that we were presented. Um, every year, the center uh, reaches out to scholars and to practitioners across the humanitarian and human rights field and asks for um, proposals on research topics or trainings that they would be interested in taking part in or possibly even developing further. Um, and so um, Mr. Bill Marino um, was one of those uh, people who submitted in a request and came up with this fantastic idea. I know that it kind of morphed a little bit into what is today, um, but considering the, the speakers that we're going to be privy to listen to from across the sector and the work that's being done, um, I think this is an apt topic for today as well as for what's going on in our world. Um, I hope that you enjoy uh, what um, the different presentations. I know that not everyone will be able to stay for the entire day, but I do hope that if you do have to leave, you'll have time to come back and join us again. Um, we will also be streaming online um, on the Watson's YouTube channel, so if you do have to leave, please feel free to continue to listen um, throughout the day. Thank you so much, um, and I'm going to hand things over to Bill, if that's all right. If this works. I, I have a laptop, yeah, I just plugged it in. Okay, looks great. Thank you so much. And thanks again, everyone, so, for coming out. And um, thanks so much to the center for making this happen. Um, so today, uh, our event is AR, AI for Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Response. It's human elements. Um, and I'm going to provide just a little bit of context on the event. And then I'll tell you about the agenda and the schedule for today. Um, so uh, between the, the war in the Ukraine and uh, the tragic earthquake in Turkey and Syria over last year, you know, I think it's clear that the need for aid and relief uh, during man-made or natural disasters is not about to go away. Uh, in fact, in the last two get decades, according to the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction 2022 Global Assessment Report, um, there is five times more natural disasters in the last two decades and in the previous three decades. And there is now a record 100 million people who are currently displaced due to enduring conflicts or weather-related events. Uh, a parallel trend is that um, is the rise in AI adoption. Um, so according to McKinsey's State of AI in 20, 2022 report, uh, up to 60% of all organizations are currently using AI. And I think we all know as consumers that AI has really begun to permeate our daily lives uh, between autonomous vehicles and voice assistants and everything else. Um, with the advent of chat GPT and other next generation AI, I think we can all agree this trend is unlikely to abate in the near future. Um, so when it comes to the intersection of these two trends, um, there has been a lot of really important work. And I'll just tell you a little bit about that to set the context here. Um, so there's been work on using uh, computer vision to analyze aerial disaster imagery, to provide situational awareness to first responders or prioritize distribution of emergency funds. And, and by the way, you'll actually be hearing about more about some of these um, projects and studies today. There's been work using natural language processing to parse social media to detect emerging disasters. Machine learning has been used to optimize the routes of supply delivery during disasters and used to detect wildfires based on optical and heat sensor data out in the fields. 
Uh, there's also been machine learning based personalized recommendation of resources to refugees based on needs and location. And as I mentioned, with the emergence of this, this next generation of um, AI tools, you know, um, everywhere I've gone the last couple months, everyone's talk, talking about GPT, and, and I can tell you that folks are already thinking about how do we apply these next generation AI technologies to humanitarian assistance and disaster response. So amidst all this really important work, we saw an opportunity for an event that put the humans who are really at the center of these events back on a pedestal. Uh, we wanted to focus on their experiences, what they're going through, um, what they have access to, what they don't as a disaster unfolds. So specifically, we, we knew we wanted to look um, at AI for humanitarian assistance and disaster response. Um, and specifically the domains of hu human-centered design in this kind of overlap, uh, human-computer interaction, and then fairness and ac accountability and transparency, an in increasingly important part of AI. Um, and just in a more plain spoken terms, we, we wanted to have an event, curate an event that focused on the real experiences that the stakeholders in these events um, the affected populations, of course, but also first responders um, and NGOs. So the real experiences that these folks are going through as these events unfold, uh, their relationships and their interdependencies, their actual resources, the devices they really have, and the accessibility that they possess during these events, and uh, their unique frame of mind and the cognitive burdens what information they have access to and what information they don't have access to, uh, how all of the above, sorry about that, just actually changes as the event evolves and unfolds. Um, and then of course, how to use these AI technologies in a fair and transparent manner. So we wanted to curate an event that focuses on those things. And uh, that's what today is all about. So at a high level, uh, the way this is going to work is that we, um, we have roughly three blocks of speakers, um, most of whom are virtual, actually. You know, um, this is an issue that affects everyone across the globe, and we want it to be inclusive um, and have good geographic representation, for example. Uh, so a virtual event was, was more amenable to that. So you're going to see a lot of our speakers are virtual. And we have about three blocks of speakers with breaks in between. And then, of course, we have lunch at the end. Um, so we, we have question and answer um, sessions or, or time allotted for that with most of the speakers, not all. Um, and I, I definitely encourage everyone to um, you know, be forthcoming with any questions you have. This is definitely going to be an interactive event. Um, so without further ado, we, we are pretty early, I think. Um, uh, but. If, if Nick, if, if, if you're ready, then, uh, then maybe we'll have you fire things up. Uh, thank you so much. like myself here at Brown, um, and uh, Nick is going to be talking about respons response community on and on the ground realities, and I'll let you take care of the rest of your bio, Nick. Cool. Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks, thanks everybody, for, for taking the time today, and thank you all for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, thank you so much to Bill and Ann for putting this on and, and dealing with all of the you know, important logistics that uh, that go into pulling together uh, you know this large of a group of speakers and across this broad of a range of topics. It's it, it really should be fantastic today. So my name is Nick Anderson. Um, like Bill mentioned, I'm uh, I'm one of the the graduate students uh, in the master's in cybersecurity program here. Uh, I, my formal roles professionally 
I'm the COO of a technology and cybersecurity company in uh, just outside of DC uh, called Invictus International Consulting, and I'm a senior fellow at the Atlanta Council. I was uh, previously the Acting Assistant Secretary of Energy for Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response, where we had everything from cybersecurity response uh, for things like, uh, yeah, it was, it was actually right after my time, but uh, you know, the Colonial Pipeline incidents uh, to uh, formal emergency response that you see with hurricane response when the power grid, uh, you know, it starts to have its impacts and go down and we start to look at, you know, getting first responders uh, on the ground. I was also uh, previously the White House official responsible for federal cybersecurity policy, and I was a senior intelligence officer in the intelligence community. Um, so I've kind of got a broad range of experiences here, but what I'm going to focus on today is not the, the technological capabilities that come in with artificial intelligence and kind of the promise that it brings, but really giving, kind of giving you a, a 101 perspective on the federal response community and what that looks like and all the different players that are involved as well as kind of just reality of on the ground, on the ground impacts. So when we're talking about uh, federal response here to any, any disaster. Uh, it doesn't matter if it is COVID-19 response, it doesn't matter if it is a hurricane, uh, it doesn't matter if it's um, a mass, mass migration issue, uh, whatever it might be, federal response is organized in the incident command structure that you see before you here. And this is the unified coordination staff which is all organized around kind of the bubble of the Unified Coordination Group, or the UCG. So when you see here, the FCO, the Federal Coordinating Officer, is somebody who's uh, technically appointed by, uh, by the President and is imbued with many of their authorities under the Stafford Act and under other various legislation that allows them to coordinate on the ground and commit the federal government to certain response activities. That's why sometimes uh, when there's a big disaster and you see the governor or a major city mayor walking around kind of surveying the damage on the news and there's somebody there with a little FEMA, FEMA shirt, a little DHS shirt trailing along behind them. Typically that's the FCO. That's the federal coordinating official who's actually on the ground and can commit federal dollars and resources to helping to solve whatever the problem might be. Everything is sort of organized around this and there's thousands of hours of training a year that are all dedicated to making sure that in the time of a disaster, everybody kind of speaks the same language and everybody understands who, who is who and what is their responsibility? So one of, my, uh, one of my roles down here at the bottom, the emergency support functions, I was the national, the national lead for emergency support, uh, support function 12, which is energy response. Anything pipeline, oil, natural gas, uh, impact to solar and winds, uh, impact to the electrical grid, anything whether it's man-made or natural disaster was my responsibility. But there's also, you know, the f 14 other agencies that are also responsible for different emergency support functions, whether it's communications, whether it's uh, civil order, uh, it could be uh, you know, uh, clean, clean and safe drinking water with the EPA, all these other agencies exist and train around emergency response and leading these different functional areas. And all of these different sections that you see here, operations, intelligence, planning, logistics, and finance and administration, they all exist across the board in the same exact sort of way. And it may seem a little bit goofy, but if you walk into an operations center, whether it is a state or local emergency operations center like you see on the left-hand side, whether it's a forward deployed incident command post, which could literally just be tents or trailers out in the field in a disaster area, or it's a local business emergency operations center, uh, you'll see people organized in this way. And they'll even be wearing little colored vests of different colors so that when somebody walks in, if I don't know who Bill is, and Bill is the logistics chief for Hurricane Nick, you know, response, you know, down in South Carolina. I can walk in, I can see that he's wearing a certain colored vest, and I can immediately know as a local official, I need to talk to Bill. Bill's got this colored vest on. That must mean that he's working logistical issues. It kind of gives everybody a common, common point of reference and a common understanding of what's, what's going on. And really, when we start thinking about technological capabilities, the people that it's being built for, the people that it's being delivered to that can actually take, uh, take advantage of these resources are the people that you see here surrounded in that box in the Unified Coordination Group. Everybody else is, is out in the field. So the, you know, the vast majority of the resources are forward deployed. And for a lot of people that means sleeping in cars and trucks, sleeping in tents. Uh, it's very, very typical if we're you know, working with uh, power companies and we're pre-staging them around, uh, around an emergency that it's very typical for those, uh, those line crews, those people in the big bucket trucks that you see repairing power lines as they go through, it's very typical for those people to be coming from multiple states away 
it's very typical for them to be sleeping in their trucks for several days at a time uh, with protein bars, Gatorade, uh, going to a Red Cross Center just to fill up with water, uh, do what they need to do. Uh, maybe if there's a shower trailer, being able to take advantage of getting a shower really quickly and switching out a pair of clothes. Uh, that sort of life, uh, at least for the first week or so after major major disaster response. And those are kind of the people we try to keep in mind as our on-the-ground responders uh, whenever we're talking about disaster recovery and longer-term resilience. So we're, we're getting to actual disaster talk, I promise. It's just uh, some of this is kind of frame, frame of reference for, you know, what's that broader community of interest that we try to design around when we think about disaster recovery uh, capabilities. So really quickly, here's a quick snapshot for you of just the types of different federal authorities that exist within, within the response community. Everything ultimately flows to the president as the head of the executive branch uh, for federal, federal response. Uh, now there's different, uh, different lines of authority that kind of come in if it's, a, if it's a local response, if the governor is using local authorities, if a mayor is deploying a police force, but ultimately everything's flowing back to the president and the Stafford Act is incredibly important with the FEMA administrator and the federal, uh, federal coordinator because even if I'm, uh, if I'm governor so-and-so and I've decided to use the National Guard to deploy them, well, if my emergency becomes a Stafford Act qualifying emergency, I'm actually going to be able to apply to the federal government for reimbursement of those resources for salary, for the logistics time, for the travel cost, for paying to feed those people, whatever it might be. If it becomes a Stafford Act emergency, suddenly there's federal dollars supporting me, which is really, really important for local communities when they're thinking about the need for those dollars to reinvest in growth and recovery and resilience over the long term for the future. So again, it's kind of a practical, uh, a practical perspective here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you, you know, pictures of just a reminder of what it actually looks like during a disaster and what you know actual uh, emergency responders are dealing with on the ground. Um, so I'm not sure how many people here might remember this, uh, but this was what was used during Katrina. This was what was used in hurricane response down in New Orleans. So you see the responder, and A, I want to point out something to you really quickly. You see that responder in the top right-hand corner. He doesn't have a lot of equipment with him. He doesn't have a lot of technology infrastructure that is available to meet their needs out there in the field. He's got a handheld radio and a cell phone, and that's probably it. And truthfully, uh, that's, that's going to be a really great day if you're deployed out in the field and you're even at a point where your cell phone can work. Everything tends to go down as communications infrastructure is impacted as a lifeline sector. And when the communications infrastructure goes down, the last thing that's available for people is their cell phone. The infrastructure is completely saturated. There's really no opportunity uh, to use that. And really, we have uh, there is a, a federal service that's available that uh, emergency responders uh, prescribe to that is, uh, that is used to prioritize their telephone calls above others so that in a time of response, there's actually get bumped up to the top of the queue uh, with, the, with the priority routing, and they're supposed to get better support, but it's, 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 it's that priority telecommunication service is kind of hit or miss. So for the person who's actually out in the field supporting disaster recovery, this is it. This is their lives. You know, they've got that. Maybe they've got a laptop back in a, back in a truck, uh, but nine times out of ten, it's really not, not fantastic. So this is just as a reminder. This is what we had to what we had to use during uh, during Katrina. Uh, so you know, and I've got kind of the example here, and it's it's a little it's a little morbid for parts of it. But starting in the left hand side, you've got the initials of the person who was leading the search. Uh, that way, if the person who's back in that unified coordination group at that local command post needs to have a question about you know this house or this building, they know exactly who to go to. The top quadrant is the date that the home was searched, and that's important to see. Do I need to cycle back through? see if maybe people were seeking shelter and it's been three or four days since we searched this quadrant and I need to be able to go back in and understand is there anybody else still there. The right quadrant is going to be able to communicate hazards uh, because that's, that's also really important. If there's been something like a natural gas leak instead of a house, I need to be able to tell people that in a way uh, that they're going to be able to easily understand because again, technology infrastructure is not really available for these people that are sort of at the edge of disaster response. They don't have the ability to pull something up reference an app and go, oh, somebody marked this in an app to say there was a natural gas pipeline that's been impacted and this house is potentially hazardous. Uh, and then in the bottom quadrant, uh, it was the body count. So that was, uh, you know, zero dB means uh, zero dead bodies that were, that were found here in this house. 
Uh, and again, if you're if you're someone who uh, you know, remembers Katrina, you remember people you know marking these on doors and marking these on the sides of buildings, because there was just no way uh, to communicate. They tried to go for about uh, about three or four days without using a system like this, and they just couldn't keep up with remembering what what ground they'd covered already, where they had been, and a lot of resources were getting uh, duplicated. And again, bottom right hand corner, again, it's just sort of I'm trying to talk to you about you know response on the ground realities. Those are members of the National Guard during Katrina, walking through almost waist deep, waist deep water. You know, this is their this is their reality when they're when they're on the ground. And really quickly, I'm just going to kind of hit on some of the other impacts with other types of uh, emergency response. Uh, we'll start in the top left hand corner. That is a wildfire in, uh, impacting an energy energy substation. Uh, so again, if you lose energy, you sort of lose everything. Um, you're going to lose water because you're going to lose the ability for water substations and pumping stations to be able to have the energy that they need to continue operating. You're going to lose communications infrastructure. You're going to lose, uh, you're going to lose just everything. The, you know, water, water, power, and communications are three ultimate lifeline sectors that impact literally every other sector. So when you have one potential disaster or disaster, this is what you're looking at. Um, and really, this is a wildfire that, uh, to be honest with you, was sparked uh, because of wind conditions, just normal wind conditions, not a hurricane, not a tornado, uh, wind conditions in the Pacific Northwest uh, that led to high voltage lines being at risk, and the high voltage lines were not powered down in advance of the wind coming in, and it dropped to the ground, and it sparked fire uh, during dry, dry conditions. Uh, the next one over, it looks like a big mudslide. Uh, those were the big floods that happened a couple of years ago in Europe, for those of you, for those of you that remember. And you see just huge swaths of local towns completely wiped out. So again, the things that we count on as technologists, uh, you know, being able to rely on infrastructure to just be there for our users to access the things that we're developing are non-existent during some of these disasters. Moving, uh, moving on, uh, the, the next one, uh, this third one right here, the smaller one, is uh, impacts of, uh, impacts of a tsunami. Uh, so you've got both flooding and fire happening at the same time. Uh, again, then that was in Japan. The big one on the right is the same exact emergency, but just a different location. And that's a natural gas facility that's on fire. And so when the natural gas facility is on fire, a lot of people don't realize natural gas is the way that a lot of our major electrical uh, facilities are powered. They're natural gas fired plants. Uh, next one moving down, uh, this one right here is Puerto Rico. So after the earthquakes in, in Puerto Rico, there were portions of the island that did not have electricity for 11 months. So these are not days and weeks problems for some areas, in particular areas that have not had the opportunity uh, to invest in resilient infrastructure over the long term. These are long term issues for them following disasters. Um, this one that was a little bit of a throwback with the broken down bridge, that was uh, Hurricane Hugo in uh, 88, 89, uh, impacting the Carolinas. Uh, and then more, more flood, more flood damage to, to be able to to be able to show you here. Actually, no, I'm sorry. That last one, uh, bottom left, uh, that's Turkey right now. So that's that's earthquake earthquake damage from Turkey response. And you'll see just it's entire communities are leveled. You're you're not going to be able to take advantage of power lines being available, of cell towers being available, of communications infrastructure, of even the ability to get people to the area. Nine times out of ten, when we're deploying local responders, we have to send them with lots of extra cans of gas and chainsaws and uh, on, on the backs of trucks so that as they're driving along they can uh, they can you know, you know use the chainsaws on trees and other fallen debris they may encounter just so they can push forward as far as they can to get into those local communities all right one of the last things i wanted to leave you with uh, is just uh, lifeline services so we kind of started reorganizing a couple years ago within the federal response community from uh, just the emergency support functions uh, like I said, I, I led ESF-12, which was energy, uh, reorganizing from those emergency support functions into, uh, into community lifelines. So you see here at the top, uh, the top you'll see things like safety and security, health and medical, energy, communications, transportation. And then you see it, uh, you see it uh, vertically. You see all the sort of elements that go into supporting that. So health and medical is an example. You, know, you need the ability to provide care. You need patient movement. You need actual public health officials, you need fatality management, and you need medical supply chain. All of those things are then impacted across the board with all the other lifeline services. 
So if I don't have, for example, like we just talked about, clear roads, I can't provide medical supply chain services. I can't get insulin to the diabetic patients that are you know, still trying to survive in the local community. I can't move patients where they need to go. You know, during one of our, uh, our responses two years ago uh, to some of the hurricanes that were impacting Louisiana because they just got hit by hurricane, they had about a week and a half, two weeks for recovery, they had another hurricane that hit them again, uh, I think this was uh, 2020, uh, you know, they didn't have the opportunity to rebuild that infrastructure to be available. So I think there were 67 surrounding hospitals in the local areas that had to take patients from, those other, uh, the, from that area, whether they're long-term care patients, uh, whether they're critical care patients uh, as a result of injuries from the disaster. It requires a, a much larger extended community to be able to provide the types of resources that are required. Uh, I'm really not going to harp on this. This is, I mean, it's, 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 it's the interdependencies of critical services to provide, you know, those essential functions that we think of with it, whether it's uh, business provided or government provided. And these are really uh, well-integrated, well-connected communities of interest that have to exist together. Uh, to be completely honest with you, I know it's not really a, a thing within the, within the, you know, the Northeast, but there's a, there's a restaurant chain that has a significant presence in the Southeast called Waffle House. Uh, and it is just sort of a greasy spoon diner establishment. I'm from South Carolina. I love Waffle House. I'm at Waffle House aficionado. Waffle House has probably one of the most sophisticated emergency operations centers uh, that I've ever dealt with uh, as far as business continuity services go. Why? Because Waffle House, that greasy spoon diner that people love to go to either really late at night uh, when they need something to help soak up other things that are affecting their health or, uh, you know, just to be able to get a quick bite to eat, they know that's a community lifeline service. People need to be able to go there. First responders need to be able to eat. People in the community need a place to go and grab a hot cup of coffee and charge their phones and do whatever they need to do. They need somewhere to be able to actually be able to try to access the FEMA website to say, yes, family, here I am. I am at uh, you know, relocation site X. I am safe. I'm alive. They've got a tremendous emergency operations center presence. Uh, so all of this is not just a government effort. These are critical infrastructure owner operators out there in the field, whether it's, uh, you know, bastions of the community like Waffle House or it's uh, large power providers or natural gas pipeline operators or home heating oil delivery services or medical services providers. It really has to be an integrated effort across the board. So especially when it comes to those disaster response capabilities, they have to be ones where people can interoperate and people can communicate irrespective of what community of interest they're representing within the local area. So I think I'm going to pause there and see if we've got any questions, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> I have to press this thing. Um, OK, great. Um, first of all, well, thank you, Nick. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes before our next speaker, so you definitely have some time for some questions. If it's all right, maybe I'll start off with a question of my own. Um, so I, I, you know, I was really excited to have Nick really open up the event with this talk um, on on the ground realities because I think it really brings into focus why we're trying to do this event. So when we hear a high-minded idea like bringing Chat GPT, do you know about Chat GPT by the way? Oh Nick? yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I've had a great okay. time playing okay. with it. Yes. Yeah, okay. It's been fun. All right. Yeah. Um, so when you hear a high-minded idea like bringing that to disaster situations to help folks on the ground. Um, you you know you, you take a step back and you start to break it down in light of some of the things that Nick talked about, right? Um, you know, folks on the ground may only have a handheld radio, they may have uh, a, a cell phone, but it may uh, the network may be overloaded. Um, it's probably running out of batteries, right? Like yep. you said, um, before they get to Waffle House to charge it. Um, so if you think about something like chat GPT, that's, that's probably running in the cloud the way it is today. If it's, if it's going to run on device, it has to be already on the device, right? You can't be downloading that as a situation unfolds. Um, and it's probably, it's a heavy model. So it might be, um, eating up your battery, even if you are able to run, run it. Um, so, you, you know, I think our, the goal of this event is to really to, to think through some of these high-level ideas about bringing AI to these situations um, in the context of some of the things that Nick is talking about. So with that said, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about when you do read about ChatGPT being applied to these situations, you know, what are some of your first 
reactions? Is it um, how do we make that possible? Is it about putting it into the hands of the right people? Um, is it is it just not possible? So I'd, I'd just love to hear your take on that. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's it's it's, it's possible as a series of models. And so what I would what I provide as an example. Uh, it's and, and it's really ir irrespective of your your opinion on you know what our what you know, what we were doing in the Middle East several years ago. There's a lot of there's a lot of actual parallels for technology delivery with what the military learned in post 9/11 Iraq and Afghanistan with well, what they call DIL DIL technologies you know disconnected intermittent and low low latency low bandwidth technologies. You know so there's kind of you know concentric rings of where can I deliver services and how do I have to deliver them. So, you know, when the military was uh, trying to kind of go through these different provinces and check and see, hmm, you know, where is there a potential, you know, a potential, you know, potential bad guy, um, you know, they would use these things like biometric technologies. And they would do things like fingerprints, they would do iris scans, they would take pictures of people, those sorts of things. And then when somebody went through a checkpoint, if they're, yes, you registered as, you know, bad guy one, two, three, uh, bad guy one, two, three would pop but that person who was on the field, you know, out in the field at a checkpoint would only have a downloaded local, locally executed copy of, you know, bad guy one, two, three and their information and the fact that somebody needed to, needed to speak with him. Um, back at the FOB, the forward operating base at somewhere around a major airfield deployed there, they had many, many more capabilities. They had heavy satellite you know, capabilities, they had terrestrial circuit capabilities, they had persistent hardwired power, uh, they had generators as backup for power. Uh, they maybe had solar that was that was being used. So they had a lot more infrastructure and a lot more uh, access and availability for telecommunications infrastructure to be able to hit uh, hit resources in a much stronger way. It's kind of the same way with disaster recovery and disaster operations. I think we just have to think about models where the more resource intensive uh, elements of using the technology that's available to us can be done at a unified coordination group level but the more lightweight capabilities that responders need to have the opportunity to train on, to learn the essential skills around these areas, and to understand how to best take advantage of the technology have to be lightweight and portable to either be able to run on a standalone laptop or be something that's, that's mobile accessible in a really, really communications degraded environment. Um, I mean, just to really kind of emphasize how poor it is when there's a disaster operation you know, a lot of times when there's major hurricanes that are getting ready to impact the East Coast in particular. There's a, a system, of, an infrastructure system of uh, towers that the Coast Guard uses for maritime rescue operations, and it's called Rescue 21. Uh, well, when those things start to go down and they're not able to communicate, uh, there are volunteers in the co what's called the Coast Guard Auxiliary, which are people that wear Coast Guard uniforms, but they're unpaid volunteers that will go and sit in these towers directly on the coast in the middle of hurricanes and most of them, a lot of them, are trained as ham, ham radio operators. And that's the communications infrastructure uh, for them to be sitting there monitoring a swath of coastline to go, oh, there's a ship out there that wasn't able to come in. It wasn't able to beat the storm. I've got a distress signal that's coming in. I need to rebroadcast that to local Coast Guard stations so that they can actually deploy responders to go there and try to save that person's life. Yeah, you know, we're using the Civil Air Patrol, which again is Sort of, sort of like the you know the Air Force that also wears a uniform, but they're unpaid civilian volunteers. We're using them in Cessnas with cameras to be able to do aerial surveillance over areas. Um, a lot of this is volunteer operations and what they have available in the fi in the field, because there's just not a lot of a, a lot. Really, the communication uh, is is a lot of times it's broken, and it's all driven by local relationships and who those people have trained with day to day and how they've sort of baked in those skills over the long term. So a lot of this has to get pushed down to the lowest level possible to be able to train people on how to use the tools that are available to them for response to be effective in a disaster. I sort of wandered all over. I don't even know if I actually answered your question. No, you did. Thank you. Thank you for the nuanced response and all the experience uh, that goes into that answer. Uh, we have about four minutes left for our next speaker. If, um, if anyone has other questions for Nick, yes. Um, if you want to say your name, that'd be that or affiliation. I, I suppose that'd be great. Sure. I'm Rob Grace, Professor here at Brown. Um, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, what I wanted to ask you, which kind of builds on what you were just saying, is um, to what extent do you perceive that the domestic disaster response structure 
is adaptable to new technology, um, do you, how hopeful should we be that whether it's AI or something else, that it can be incorporated in, in, in an effective um, uh, 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 manner? And is there a past example that you could point to where you could say, yes, there is like new technology that was uh, implemented? Because like you, you mentioned, it requires training, but it requires like some institutional buy-in and adaptability and also like, you know, effective um, communication and coordination between engineers and the actual responders and making sure that the technological tool is actually addressing a need that responders actually have. Yeah, so I, I, um, so I guess, yes, I, I have a lot of hope that, uh, that, you know, the infrastructure will continue to evolve and change over time. And I guess number two, for an actual example of that, I would point to COVID-19. So this was, this, this structure of the Unified Coordination Group, this structure was the same exact structure that was used for COVID-19 response. And was that a major change from typical federal disaster response? Absolutely. And were there a ton of growing pains? 100%. Uh, but the different types of technology that were needed to, uh, to respond to a public health emergency in that way, eventually everybody kind of got their act together and was, were able to integrate uh, information sharing, they were able to integrate uh, testing, you know, test kit distribution, they were able to train people on test kit use, they were able to uh, integrate public, uh, public health messaging, uh, and they were really able to integrate in a way where this, this response group, whether it was state emergency operations centers, local centers, uh, federal coordination uh, associated, largely went virtual because they had to, just like the rest of the world, the FEMA Emergency Operations Center was on lockdown. So when I walked over there in the middle of, you know, middle of COVID response, and I'm, I'm the person who's wanting to make sure that we've got enough test kits and enough uh, you know, early you know, vaccine that's available to send to power plants because all of our power plant control center operators are all in a very, very high risk you know, population. There's very, very few of them that are actually qualified and they've all been doing the job for years. They were all in a higher risk uh, category. Um, yeah, they, we, we were able to adapt to using virtual coordination technologies and, in, in a way that federal disaster response just had not. It was, it, was, it was very sort of traditional technologies like we talked about, you know, uh, amateur radio, uh, cell phone technologies, laptops in the field, uh, those sort of things. Um, and this, this group of people, I think, is incredibly motivated to integrate new technologies because they see the impact. You know, this is not a group of people, uh, whether they're, they're like me and they're in, they're in D.C., uh, you know, where they live and, live and work or not, this is a group of people that every single day they're thinking about how is the next thing going to impact real people and going to impact their lives. And these are the groups of people that are, you know, keeping a bag in their car and are deploying and going down somewhere and sleeping in a tent for weeks at a time just to help local communities respond. So they're incredibly motivated to integrate new technology and new capabilities against that problem set. And so I'd say even, even for user groups where we would typically say maybe they'd be a challenge in trying to change, uh, train them in new skills and uh, trying to introduce kind of new abilities into their toolkit. This is an, an incredibly motivated group of people that are really, really resilient when it comes to uh, needing to be motivated to integrate those new technologies for that reason. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's see if we have Alex, our next speaker, um, waiting, um, or if we yeah. have, Looks like he's on. Alex is there. Okay, great. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for opening up the event. Uh, let's give uh, Nick a, a hand. And um, now we are very honored to have uh, Alex Bornyakov, uh, who is the um, Deputy Minister of, the D of Digital Transformation uh, of the Ukraine. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us um, and uh, for giving some remarks. Uh, well, hi everyone, and thank you for having me here. In the immediate time frame, we're in still not too uh, late in Ukraine, since <laughs> it's relatively early in the states. Um, yeah, and it's been a great honor to me to speak today about Ukrainian development in artificial intelligence and more generative technologies and how it affects humanitarian assistance and disaster response in our country. So, in um, in 2022, uh, Ukraine took 62nd place in the Oxford Government AI Redis Index. 
And the critical bar of this index is the openness of the data. In this first condition for using the, it is, a, it is the first condition for using the abilities of AI to improve the quality of public services. Um, and apparently Ukraine took second place in the open data maturity rating last year among 35 countries. Um, and the first place was for France. So the maturity level of open data in Ukraine is 97%. In, in I think in comparison, uh, the average figure in Europe is 82. So we even above average in, in Europe. So deep knowledge and analytics company complied AI in Eastern Europe industry landscape rating by the number of companies working in the field of AI. Uh, Ukraine is one of three leaders among Eastern European countries. 58 companies in the uh, in this area work in, in Ukraine. And uh, I think there was like almost even, even more than 10,000 people working on AI specific tasks for these companies. Um, and our goal is bring Ukraine to a new level of digitalization of the economy, improve the state administration system, transparency and many other things, accountability of course, and increase the country's cybersecurity and defense capabilities. This is the new reality. This is where we work. Uh, and uh, we also want to enter top 10 countries in artificial intelligence development. And we actually work in it. So if I give you a brief uh, overview of IT landscape in Ukraine in 2022, IT companies earned $7.3 billion for Ukrainian economy. And even in times of war, which is absolutely I don't know, unbelievable. Uh, the industry grew almost 5%, even in times of war. Um, so that's, that's just uh, amazing. And actually IT industry in Ukraine remains the only expert industry of Ukraine that uh, grew uh, in, in, in the times of full scale war. So coming back to public sector, Artificial intelligence algorithms in Ukraine work with open data. For example, the court register, we call it WinCourt, an automatic analysis model on the court, Ukrainian court, um, um, and also monitoring the state environment, such as the deep green Ukraine the forest plantation monitoring services also works on AI basis, or identifying risk in a public procurement, such as project called Dozoro. So, AI is actually actively using by Ukrainian government. And when the Russian started a full-scale war against us, the entire country and its economy began to work on victory. So the Ukrainian IT sector had a challenge of developing cutting edge technologies that make a difference in front lines. And um, it's like military tech areas. So government uses artificial intelligence technologies in cyber protection system to ensure the work of, of, uh, of state uh, uh, registers, systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's about autom automation of uh, autom autom automatic analysis and classification of cyber threats and choosing a strategy for their prevention or defense. Um, <clears throat> AI is helping us also identify Russians who committed war crimes in our cities. So the system identified their uh, faces, looking for social profiles or any other mentions. Uh, drones with artificial intelligence track enemy equipment and destroy it. And Ukraine already has military tech developments that meet NATO standards. Uh, we also have Ukrainian startup fund that support project in the military tech. The fund launched the Fast Track to Victory project in Ukraine a few months ago. And Ukraine now has the most un uncomplicated procedure in Europe for admitting UAVs to use in the army. We also plan to create research projects in the field of artificial intelligence in national security. And it's about R&D accelerators and education program in the military tech. Um, I believe that Ukraine has experience in the real time utilization of all military technologies on the battlefield, setting the stage for a strong presence in, in the global IT market. We will likely see even more military technology solutions in the coming years in Ukraine, including AI. We uh, have like this military tech industry booming right now with hundreds of new startups uh, period in the last couple of months. 
So today, and we also believe that, that technology is critical to victory on the battlefield, on the economic front and in cyberspace. And this technology will help us restore the country after the victory. So again, we aim that Ukraine will become a leading European AI hub in security solutions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, do you have time for one or two questions from the audience? Is that, is yes, that something sure. you have time for? Um, would anyone like to ask Alex a question? Um, if not, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick things off. We have microphones, by the way, that we'll pass around for anyone who'd like to. Yep, yep. If you want to state your name and affiliation again for Alex, that Sure, that yeah. Um, Alex, thank you so much for these uh, comments. I'm uh, Rob Grace, professor at Brown University. Um, I was just very intrigued by the use of AI to help in identifying war crimes. And um, just com very curious to hear if there's more you can say about how how AI is used for that. Thank you. So uh, we basically faced with this issue when uh, they were around Kiev, and then when they left, we have this lot of security footage where they were committing crimes and killing civilian peoples and robbing houses. And then later, there was a CCTV uh, footage from Belarusian uh, logistics centers where they have taken all these uh, things that they stole from people and they're uh, sending back to their homes. So there was a problem to find out who really committed. And um, we uh, and we um, we understood that it's impossible to kind of like compare the like image on CD, CD, CTV footage, security footage, and then on uh, like finding their profile. So um, the, this is how actually partnership with Clear uh, Clearview AI, AI started. So they helped with the technology, but there was a, there, there was not just their technology stack. There was a number of uh, solutions. So that basically, we were taking uh, security footages, upload to the system, and then system uh, uh, was looking for matches in pictures in their social networks in and in, 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 in the picture on security footage, and then give you a result. And this is how our prosecutors actually work today on those crimes. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, um, my name is Akira um, I'm just an interested yeah. high school student. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, if you've been able to use AI to sort of provide humanitarian assistance to civilians at all, and uh, how that works, what you guys might be using it for in that area. Uh, we not using it yet. We just, you know, for, from this kind of like new technologies, we're starting to use blockchain for uh, helping refugees. So that, that's that's the track that we're now exploring. But uh, I'm not familiar, or I don't have examples of the cases. So I'm, not, I'm just I'm not aware of the cases where AI was used to help um, refugees. Not Alex, Alex, if you, if you don't mind expounding, I would be curious about the use, the application of blockchain that you just mentioned. Yeah, so, uh, so we we also like exploring different things. Um, we uh, recently joined um, an initiative of European Union called uh, European Blockchain Initiative e -E EBI. And um, uh, as observer, since we, we cannot be part until we become member of the European Union, but they were, were uh, so nice, they put us as observer and uh, they created like a, a national blockchain in Europe supported by government. And one of their pilot projects is to move all their um, university diplomas into blockchain. So people who will travel around uh, Europe, Europe from different universities don't have to bring a apostyle or they have to like prove that's the really not a fake diploma. So they wanna create one database with all the diplomas in blockchain bulletproof that they're 100% real. So we joined this um, uh, pilot and we wanna also um, and this actually can also help refugees because if you leave country and then you go to another country, 
and you want to find a proper job for you, then you have to prove that you have certain education. So that's that's why we consider this as important project. So this is now being implemented. Um, what else? Well, yeah, that that would be, I think, the, the biggest one. Maybe there's some other minors, but not on the top of my head. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. It sounds like an important project. We probably have time for one more question of Alex, um, if uh, if there is one. I, I, I could uh, conclude with one question. Mm -hmm. One more. One more question, Alex, and thanks again so much for your time. Okay, excellent. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Mike Delaney, and I... Um, I have uh, worked in the humanitarian sector most of my life. Uh, I, with, uh, I was the humanitarian director at Oxfam and, and uh, currently a consultant. I work with the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and local organizations around the world. Uh, first of all, um, it's great that you're here and just want to extend our, uh, our support to you uh, during these Thank trying you. times. Um, I uh, was aware that um, there are still many uh, local organizations in Ukraine um, that are doing humanitarian assistance, but not getting um, the aid um, that they um, that they need. And um, so, I just was curious: is there anything that you are thinking about, or or, or have ideas that there could be some application towards um, with AI towards towards this or um, any any thoughts in that direction? Well, um, with, the, with, this, with this chat GPT thing, we, we started to think that um, we could actually create an um, and system, automated system to guide them uh, through the process of, uh, I don't know, getting this help and uh, and basically using AI as a, uh, I don't know, as a consultant or as a, as a helper that can answer your question because it's impossible right now in Ukraine to like, create a call center or like give people uh, proper attention or enough attention or over the phone. Electricity is uh, sometimes it's off. We have blackouts. We have problems with the, uh, those uh, rocket strikes. So you can really put a lot of people in one room because it's if rocket hits like everyone dead. So I think using AI to uh, I know guide people uh, to uh, figure out what they need and uh, give them uh, uh, a trap uh, to get this help is is is, is uh, something we we now talking to open AI. So they open Chat GPT for for Ukraine. And it's going to happen because they blocked it for for, <laughs> for some reason. Uh, well, we know the reason, but never mind. Anyway, so I think that the application of AI to talk to people and maybe calm them down, maybe give them some guidance and support. That's that's the example that I'm thinking about. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. Alex, <clears throat> thank you uh, for the vital work that you're doing. Thank you again for taking the time to talk to us today. It was a great honor. And uh, let's, let's give Alex a big hand. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, guys.